friends, I'm back again. I'm sorry for the technical difficulty. My voice cut off um, in the previous video, and I'm going to just continue on where I left off. I, of course, I have different clothes on, uh, but I had to had to leave for an appointment, and I just came back, and we'll resume uh, what we've been studying. I was starting to say that the five books of Moses, they lay the foundation for the coming of Jesus in that in those books, God chooses and brings into being a nation. First, he chooses Abraham. And that's almost always the way God works is he works through an individual. And then through Abraham comes the nation of Israel, comes the word of God, uh, comes the people of God, and then comes the Messiah of God through the nation of of Israel. And as God's chosen people, then Israel became the custodians, the guardians of the Old Testament, uh, the recipients of the covenants of promise. And they were the channel through which Jesus, the Messiah, came. You can see that in Romans chapter 3 and verse 2, and then in Romans 9 uh, verses 1 through 5. One Old Testament scholar writes this. He says, he says, it is universally regarded by both the Jewish and Christian traditions as being foundational to whatever else the Old Testament and the New Testaments say theologically. And so we're going to spend a lot of time in the Pentateuch, in the, in the law, the books of Moses, all the same thing because it's so foundational to the rest of the Old Testament. And when the prophets rebuke Israel for turning away from God, they will often cite the, the books of Moses, the law, uh, which is primarily the moral law. Now, we're getting into Genesis now. Um, the word Genesis in Hebrew is Bereshith, and it means beginnings. The the, the word that we're familiar with, if we understand English, Genesis comes from uh, the Greek, which means beginnings or birth as well. And so uh, it really is the birth of everything. It's the beginning, the birth of all that exists, all the planets, all the solar systems. It's the beginning of man made in God's image and after his likeness. It's the beginning of families. It's the beginning of nations. Uh, it's the beginning of everything. And so, obviously, Genesis is extremely foundational. Now, one thing that's going to be extremely important for us to keep in mind is this. In the Mesopotamian culture, now Mesopotamia is an ancient uh, word that really describes what is modern-day Iran and Iraq. That is in ancient times was known as the land of Mesopotamia. That's where Abraham came from, Ur of the Chaldees, and that's again in the region of Mesopotamia. Now, particularly, uh, it's going to be vital for us to keep in mind the historical context in which Moses wrote Genesis. Particularly, the Mesopotamian literature of the ancient Near East demonstrates to us the vast differences between the entrenched, widespread polytheism of that culture compared to biblical literature. Now, what is polytheism? It is, it is uh, the worship of many gods. Each, the Egyptians worshipped many gods. The Canaanites worshipped many gods. All of those cultures back then had turned away from God by the time Abraham comes forward, uh, and they are, they are idolaters. They're pagan worshipers. And there's a vast, vast difference between them and the God of Scripture. One commentator writes this. He says, it's God, speaking of the gods of the Mesopotamian culture, uh, they were personifications of natural forces. So there were gods for uh, the rain. There were rain gods, lightning gods, the sun god, the moon god, 
uh, uh, gods for crops and fertility and all of those things. Now, uh, they also were highly immoral. They lied, uh, they stole, they were fornicators, and they were murderers. For those gods, mankind enjoyed no special role at all as the highest created earthly being. Now that stands in complete opposition to Genesis 1, 26 through 28, where we find that God made man in his image, male and female, he created them in his image and according to his likeness. So the God of scripture exalts us. He honors us. He places dignity on us. But all of the pagan gods were just the opposite. So uh, for the pagan gods, man was the lowly servant of those divine masters uh, made to provide them with food and offerings. Now, in absolute contrast, the biblical narratives, narratives present one true, all-holy, omnipotent God who, as creator, stands prior to and independent of the world. Uh, you see, even in the Old Testament, where he says that... Uh, he has no need of man whatsoever. Um, if I can find it, hold on with me. I think it's in Psalm chapter, I think it's Psalm 55. I was just reading it the other day. And um, let's see. Let's see if it's Psalm 55. Bear with me here. Well, it's not Psalm 55. Maybe it's Psalm 50. Uh, let's see if it's Psalm 50. Yeah, Psalm 50 and verse 12. Now he says, God says in Psalm chapter 50, verse 10, Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know, this is amazing, I know every bird of the mountains, this is God speaking, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. So the point there is that uh, God has no need whatsoever of man, zero, but he chooses uh, to reach out to man and to build man up and to exalt him. And that's the major difference between the God of Scripture and the God of the pagan gods. So he's independent of the world, but he speaks and the elements come into being. His work is good and harmonious and whole. So we read in Genesis 1, uh, six times God saw that it was good. That's a tremendous insight at the very beginning of Scripture into the nature of God. He wants things to be good. Then when he creates man, what does Moses say? God saw that it was very good because only man is created in his image and, and according uh, to his likeness. So then although the human family rebels, God tempers his judgment with mercy, supporting and maintaining them with grace and patience. Now another significant difference between the God of Scripture and other pagan deities, in this case the Canaanite gods, is that Elohim is personal. That, that word Elohim is where we get our word God from. It is, the, it is a plural of majesty, Elohim, and um, that's an M right there. I, let me, let me make that a little bit clearer. Elo, I'll try to do a better job on my M's. Elohim, the I-M in Hebrew is uh, plural. 
So at the very beginning, when we read in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We are beginning to see the plurality of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but yet one God. Uh, we've already gone over the Trinity, but I'll go back over that again if I need to. Now, um, so Elohim is a personal God. He creates man in his image and according to his likeness. He fellowships with them. He walks with man in the garden. Um, he, has, he gives them tender care. He creates Eve out of Adam's side. And we find over and over and over that God is personal. The Canaanite gods were primarily associated with places, whereas the God of Scripture is associated with people. Now, it's also going to be helpful to note at the outset, there, there are four major themes in Genesis, which uh, one commentator points out that they often recur throughout Genesis. First, the nature and implications of the fact that God is creator. That's the very beginning of scripture. We find out that God is creator and, and he's the creator of all that exists. And accordingly, then we all owe our devotion, our love, our allegiance to him. The second important theme is the radical seriousness of sin. The third, And we find that, of course, when Adam and Eve rebel against God and they listen to the serpent who is the devil instead of God. The third recurring theme um, is the way in which God uh, in the way in which God's judgment meets human sin at every single point. The fourth recurring theme is the presence nonetheless and almost surprisingly of God's preserving sustaining grace. So even though man is punished and there are consequences for his sin, God continues to give him grace. Even with the flood, uh, Moses or, or Noah built that ark for more than a hundred years and he was a preacher of righteousness. So there's no question that Moses was preaching about God's mercy, the judgment to come, and the people wouldn't listen. So God gave them time to repent. We'll talk a lot about that as we move along. Now, speaking of his grace, we find a candid portrayal of God's people as sinners and as failures. We see that in Genesis. We see that Abraham, who is the great man of faith, often has faith failures. And yet, God in his grace looks at Abraham's overall life and calls him uh, a man of faith and even refers to him as friend. Uh, Abraham is the friend of God. Noah is disobedient to God, but he's still called in the New Testament a righteous man. Lot is found to be greedy and selfish, and yet he is extolled in Hebrews 11. Uh, Rebecca and Jacob are deceptive and they're manipulative. Joseph's brothers are vindictive and treacherous. However, uh, there's reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers uh, towards the end. Now, uh, the author of Genesis was Moses. He wrote Genesis somewhere around 1450 BC. And the, the theme, the overall theme and purpose of Genesis is to reveal God's nature, his purpose, and his plan for humanity. Ultimately, Genesis, as in every book of the Bible, is about God. It's a book about God. It is God revealing himself to us through his servant Moses so that we can know him, so that we can know who we are, why we're here, what he expects of us, and where we're going where we're heading in the future. Um, I'm going to skip through a few, a little bit of the notes. Um, in the book of Genesis, all the major themes of the Bible have their origin. 
Um, I already referred to the, the Holy Trinity has its origin in the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis is a book of many beginnings. In Genesis, we see God's goodness in the creation of all that exists out of nothing from Genesis 1 uh, and 2. And then we see the sixfold repetition. I've already mentioned this of God saw that it was good six times. And then when he creates um, man and woman, he says it is very good. We see the Garden of Eden or Paradise in Genesis, and then we see it again in Revelation 21 and 22. God reveals to us in Genesis that he created us in his image and according to his likeness. This image was utterly marred through Adam and Eve's sin and rebellion against him. However, in that um, uh, in this great theme of God's gracious restoration and redemption of man, God determines to redeem man from his sin and restore that beautiful image of God in him, which the New Testament later addresses. Um, and you've got the, the references there. For example, in Romans chapter 8, and verse 29, if you'll turn with me to Romans 8 and verse 29. Romans 8 and verse 29. I think this is this is the, the, the main goal of Scripture. In Romans 8 and verse 29, uh, Paul writes, For those whom he foreknew, that is God, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the highest among many brethren, the, the, the most honored. That Greek word uh, firstborn uh, refers to a primacy of, of place and position and honor. So the, the goal that God has is to restore that image in us that was lost through um, Adam and Eve's sin. Genesis describes God's creation of the animals and how man is forever associated with the animals. Later, we see his continued emphasis of redeeming man's relationship with the animals. That's just an extraordinary thing, isn't it? In fact, if you'll turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, we're going back to the Old Testament. Isaiah 11 and verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 11. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of this. And I don't know how well it'll come out. Um, I'll, I'll hold it up to you. This is a picture of it's an old picture that was, um, or painting that was done in the 1800s. And I was able to get a, a copy of it um, many years ago. And what you see here is um, the wolf dwelling with the lamb and the leopard uh, lying down with the young goat or the kid, the cow and the bear will graze. There's a bear right there. The lion will eat straw like the ox, and a little boy will lead them. I'll read the verse to you in just a moment. What's happening here is the kingdom of God is advancing, and now you're seeing flowers and growth, but in the background, you have uh, wilderness pictures. You have the city of Babylon going up in smoke, and you have all of man's uh, kingdoms in ruin and the kingdom of God is coming forward. Well, you see that in Isaiah 11 uh, verses 6 through 9. This gives me great hope. He says, and this is in context, um, this is, well, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to ask you to turn to Isaiah 11 verse 1 and I'm going to read all the way through verse 9. This is important because 
Because even in Isaiah, the Bible is prophesying where the future is headed. And it's a miraculous future. Watch this in Isaiah 11, verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, that is the father of David, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit, speaking of the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Remember what Jesus said in, in the first sermon that he preached, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, although he's quoting Isaiah 61. But the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding that First, the Spirit of the Lord. Second and third, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Uh, fourth and fifth, the Spirit of counsel and strength. And the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The sevenfold um, aspect of God the Holy Spirit will rest on the Messiah and enable him to do uh, the work that the Father sent him in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Even though he's perfectly God, in his humanity is entirely dependent upon the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the importance of that is that he is showing us, Jesus is showing us how to depend upon the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. Well then, he says, um, he will delight in the fear of the Lord, that is reverence. And you see that throughout the life of Jesus. And he will not judge by what his eyes see. He says, I only do what the Father tells me. And uh, verse 4, but with righteousness, he will judge the poor. The poor in the Old Testament is often referring to not economic poor necessarily, but afflicted, those who are wounded, those who are downcast. They're, they're spiritually poor. They're, they're hungry and desperate for God. So he says, but with righteousness, he will judge the poor. And the idea there of judging is vindicating. In this particular case, the Hebrew, there, the Hebrew word there is mishpat, which can be translated uh, to vindicate. So the Messiah is going to vindicate those who are spiritually desperate. And of course, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and he will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. That's why, you see, in me explaining the first part of verse 4, with righteousness he will judge the poor, and, and, and trying to bring out the meaning of the Hebrew that he will vindicate them, and that the poor are spiritually hungry, you see that in the next part of verse 4, where he says that this Messiah will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Paul, looking back on this verse, quotes it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, speaking of how the Messiah will slay the Antichrist with just one word. Don't you love that? And then in verse 5, and also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Then we come to verse 6, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them. I showed you that that uh, picture. The, the little boy is leading a lion. Can you imagine that? And a leopard is behind him. And what does is, what is Isaiah, say, Isaiah say here? Uh, also the cow and bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy 
in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. And that word knowledge is, is a very personal, experiential knowledge. Oh, loved ones, doesn't that give you hope that a day is coming when, when the Messiah returns, that, he, that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, and there will be such peace because of his presence that the enmity between the animals and us will be gone. It will be vanished. And that's an extraordinary thing and only that can only come about through the Messiah. So um, there's going to be a, a reconciliation and a turnaround back to what was normal in the times of Adam and Eve. Now the other thing that we find in Genesis is spiritual warfare. We find it immediately in Genesis 3 with Satan's lies and temptation of the man and the woman. Remember he said, did God really say? So what is he doing? He is in injecting doubt about the word of God right there in the beginning in Genesis. And then uh, when Eve, um, when she stands for God and, and defends him, what does Satan do? He says, uh, you will surely not die. There he is a liar. So that's why Jesus calls him in John 8:44, he is the father of lies. And in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. Um, so we find other things about Satan in the New Testament, but the beginning of the doctrine of spiritual warfare is right there in Genesis. A major theme of Genesis, and indeed the entire Bible, is the call of God of Abraham out of pagan idolatry. We can find that he was a, a pagan worshiper. He was a, uh, an idolater in Joshua 24 and verse 2 and following. Um, from this man, as I mentioned earlier, God is going to redeem the world from its sin and restore those who will trust him back into the image that man lost through Adam and Eve's sin. One commentator writes, the call of Abraham is represented as this free expression of divine favor and grace. It's not the reward of merit, nor even the recognition of service. The human aspect is ignored. We don't know why God chose Abraham, and at the time his name was Abram, which is exalted father, or Abram, or Avram is how it would be uh, pronounced in Hebrew. We don't know why God chose Avram. But eventually, of course, he changed Avram's name to Avraham, or Avraham, who is the exalted father of the nations. Uh, so there's something powerful about a prophetic name. This is called salvation history, another major theme of Scripture. As God sovereignly chooses one man, Abraham, to call out a nation for himself as his chosen people. And it's through this nation that he will bring them and the world, the Messiah and the Savior, to accomplish his eternal plan of redemption and restoration. And you see that in Genesis 12 um, through 22. That is Genesis chapters 12 through 22. Um, I'm going to take a break now, so I'm going to pause right here.